Thanks, everyone. Good morning. Um, yeah, we're stuck in agile bureaucracy, but that but there is hope. That's what I'm going to talk to you about in the last uh, in the, in the next uh, next half hour or so. Um, so about six years ago, uh, Geek and Poke released this uh, comic, right? This this little agile this this little thing here is our, is our agile project, and finally we're agile, right? I mean, everywhere I show this slide, and I've been showing this slide for for six years as well. It's it's a bit, um, you know, every, everywhere I show it, some people are like, oh, this is really true for me. And other people are like laughing, but also like, ah, yeah, it's, it's kind of true, right? <laughs> we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and I've started to wonder, like, is it, is it improving? Is it getting any better? So um, somebody posted this on Twitter uh, <laughs> just last week. And I was like, OK, this is, I think this is really a sign uh, that some people are getting cynical. Right? The, only, the only quote was uh, hashtag agile, hashtag transformation. Right? This agile coach comes to help this guy with his wheelbarrow and kind of he ends up with the same thing. Um, I mean, there's, there's still a lot of work to do. And I think one of the reasons why, why we're getting cynical and, and the, the vast majority of people are getting cynical is because we're often not talking about the same thing. Right? We're just getting confused about what, what do we mean when we're, when we're talking about agile. Um, so one of, the, one of the anecdotes I have for you is when I worked with a, with a large institution um, to, and I started working with them to help them on their transformation and asked them, so do you, do you work agile? Like, how, how is it going? And this is pre-pandemic. Uh, the person with dry eyes told me, you know, yes, I work agile because I work from home. <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, what? <laughs> like, do you do, what does that mean? Do you do retrospectives or like, no, no, no I work from home. So uh, I work agile. And, and I was like, sorry, I, I just don't compute. I don't understand. So he showed me the definition of agile that HR department gave them. Which was all about, you know, uh, talking about uh, home working, about phase retirement, job rotation, right? It's, it doesn't make any sense. Like th th some, some HR person branded this as being agile, and now, and now that's what they did. And that's the problem, I think. Like everything is agile, which means actually nothing is agile. And we just have to realize, I mean, you are all agile experts here in the room, uh, that a large, large part of the population still don't really know what it means when we talk about agile. Um, they cannot distinguish what we're trying to say here. So, like, you know, we just have still a lot of work to do there. Um, another sad but true quote is this one, right? In our company, two thirds of the people are busy telling the other one third what to do. And this was true before we did Agile. And I wonder if you, if you look closely to many of the organizations that you're in, like, is, is this really changing? Isn't it still the case that in a lot of cases we have layer upon layer that are making decisions, that are deciding what to do, that are deciding the strategy, that are kind of telling people or controlling and checking and everything. Um, and then there's a small group of people that are trying to actually do the work. Um, so I wonder like, if you look at the balance, is it shifting, is it not shifting? Uh, I guess it depends. Um, so let's take a look at what is true for you. So um, this is the, uh, some quotes from the Deloitte Business Agility Survey 2021. And they asked a large population, um, what, which anti-patterns have you observed at your company? So I'm going to walk you through the top 10, and I just want to have a sense in the room, like, is this true for, for where you work? Our governance and control processes are designed for, designed for old ways of working. Leaders are not incentivizing improving ways of working. Lack of why, no shared understanding of why change matters. And our functions, finance, HR, compliance are not engaging and a high degree of command and control or lack of psychological safety. So if, if at least one of these are true for you, could you raise your hand just to get a sense? Oh man, this is I'm so sad now. It's like uh, over, over half of the room uh, recognize some of it. I'm sorry? I'm glad, yeah. So if you, have, if you checked off all the boxes, raise your hand. OK, that's, that's definitely not it. That's just, that's, yeah, yeah, I feel, I feel a little bit better. I could have given you scratch cards, like of these uh, bingo cards, and see who, how far we got. So this was just the top five. Let's look at the other uh, five in the top 10. Focus on practices and frameworks over culture, processes or tools before people. Output focus rather than outcomes and value. So focusing on plans, points, velocity, milestones. One size fits all. Insistence on a rigid framework or process, irrespective of unique context. Agile in IT only and a deterministic mindset, assuming the future is predictable. So let's, let's, let's take another look. If you recognize more than one. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> we have so much work to do. All right, so this is what I would say. Still, you know, we, we have Agile and we still have bureaucracy, right? And, and how, how is that serving us? So what is happening? Like, what is, what is really causing this? What, what do we think is, is actually underneath this? So let, let me give you um, my assumptions and my ideas of what it could be. 
first of all, we are all very familiar with financial debt, right? So you take a loan and you have to pay interest on that loan and you have to pay back. So that is financial debt. Then I'm sure, because this is an agile conference, a lot of you also know what technical debt means, right? So you, uh, you write code, you maybe take some shortcuts, and then over time you need to refactor certain bits because you know, it doesn't work anymore. Um, so that's technical debt. But there is another third one, which, we, which is kind of a, a, a nice way of thinking about it, which is organizational debt. It's all of those principles and practices that we apply that no longer serve the original purpose. Right? All of those things that, um, that were installed for a good reason a while ago, but nobody ever reconsidered or rethought about it. So when we start implementing Agile, um, you know, we should definitely look at some organizational debt and start, start removing some of that, right? Because that organizational debt is dragging every organization down. Um, so principles and beliefs ha haven't really changed. So here's, here's one way of, of describing this challenge, right? So we're, we're trying to solve the same problem, of a safe, and, and, uh, safe intersection between roads with a high amount of throughput. Um, and, and very often, you know, we design our organizations as if we have a traffic light at intersection. So the principles and beliefs behind the traffic light intersection is that we need to tell people what to do. Um, and then the, the roundabout example of that is people can actually basically figure it out, right? So we assume that the people in the system can be trusted to solve a complex problem when they're faced with it. Um, there's another big change in principles and beliefs here is because in the, in the example with the traffic light intersection, we also assume that we can predict all the possible scenarios that are happening. So we program that into that little computer box in the middle, and then we run that script, which means that in the middle of the night when there's no traffic and you arrive at the intersection, you might be stuck there and just waiting around for no, for no reason. So and the, the system on the, on, the, on the roundabout actually lets go of that idea, right? So those are two of the principles of beliefs. And if we start, you'll continue to do edge implementations with the, with the traffic light intersection, uh, you're, gonna get, you're not gonna get what you wanna get, right? So, um, John Cutler, I'm a huge fan of him. He, he recently posted something really nice about OKRs, uh, one of the practices we see you know, uh, growing across the organizations. And uh, you know, we have OKRs, there's, there's fleet levels, there's all sorts of ways to do goal setting. And that is one of those practices that could easily become another agile bureaucracy. Right? So uh, you have to use OKRs to, uh, to align and empower teams. That's where it's, what it's used, to, used for. Right? You, you, if you trust your teams, you can actually use OKRs to get better results and outcomes because now we know what it is. It will create more alignment, more communication, more collective commitment. But if you start implementing OKRs and similar practices with a command and control mindset, you don't get there. Right? So you get more control, you get more individual commitment, and you, just, you, you cannot get the outcome that you want to have. Um, there's also a challenge with how we implement Agile. Um, this is a, it's a pattern, and unfortunately, like every week I still have examples of, of, of how this is going. So, so often we go, you know, there's a management team or another team that says, you know, let's, let's go Agile. And behind doors, they make a design, they make a decision, and then they kind of roll it out over the organization with a timeline, with deadlines, like we want to have 40 teams onboarded by, by the end of next quarter, and like this is, this, this is going, going in a very plan-driven way, and then we will standardize the framework, right? We're gonna we're gonna create this is what, how everybody needs to work, and there's no little there's very little room for local customization. So even when when you know when you arrive with your agile transformation at the department and you start working in this way, and somebody raises his hand like, you know what? It doesn't really improve how I work. It it's not really helping. So what do we do then? Well, very often we say, I'm sure that is resistance. Let's let's convince that person to to do it and try it anyway. Um, so it's about telling instead of listening. And I think there's, there's something wrong with that model. It's like, like we're trying to go from A to B through A, right? We're, you know, we're trying to get uh, to B with an old approach. This is very traditional plan-driven change management, and I don't think it really works. Um, another challenge here is like uh, our risk tolerance for change is off. So you know, instead of asking, instead of trying anything new, let's play it safe by continuing our slow decline into obsolescence, right? So, the challenge is often when we are done with our agile transformation, we have no way of evolving the model. So there's no, no standardized or structured way to say, you know what, let's, let's change the things that are actually not working for us based on the model that we picked. So people forget that the evolutionary part is actually the most important part. And then the reasons for that are like, you know, no, 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 no let's not change it because it was so painful to implement it. Let's not change it again, right? So it's kind of, uh, and, and that I think is risky, right? People think that, that the risk is, to change, but the risk is actually to stay the same in my mind. And then some people will come to me and say, you know, oh, what do you think about safe? 
Irian, uh, you have all this nice, you must like, you must be a hater of SAFE, right? Because that is, that looks like command and control. And there might be people here in the room that actually love SAFE and have really great results with SAFE. There's a big, <laughs> there's a big divide in our community. There's a big debate in our community about what is SAFE, is it good, is it bad, is it evil? And I think that in itself is not helpful. And maybe you're wondering why there's a screwdriver on the slide. Because my question is, is a screwdriver evil? Is it evil? Well, you can do evil things with a screwdriver, right? And I don't have to paint some pictures here. You all have great fantasy <laughs> about what that could be. But um, in itself, a screwdriver is just a tool, right? And I think, I think we should look at frameworks in that way. Um, we should really be critical. I think just blaming that tool won't really help at all. Uh, in my mind, there are very useful elements in SAFE that we can use to solve certain specific problems. And there are things in there that are not super helpful. And uh, you know, this one size fits uh, for all approach, and you, you can probably hear it from how I'm talking, that doesn't work for me. Um, so I would definitely say experiment with the useful bits, and you know, your mileage may, var may vary. You, your, your experience might, might be different from someone else. So let's stop blaming tools and frameworks. I think the same conversation could be true about the Spotify model, right? Because maybe the other camp says, well, we shouldn't do safe, we should do the Spotify model. And I think we have the same problem there. Like the moment you start implementing that without actually doing some thinking and looking at your local actual problem that we're trying to solve, you, you might not end up, I mean, who, who here works at a company that creates a music player that wants to scale globally, right? There's, I, I'm guessing nobody, right? And, and still many of us say, well, let's do the Spotify model, and then people are happy and kind of excited about that. So, um, I mean, and definitely I, I wrote an article about how to build your own Spotify model, which, which kind of hints into this idea. All right, so um, this is a bit like, this was the sad part of the talk, um, and maybe a bit depressing. Uh, so I want to give you some hope. Now, there is definitely some hope and some slivers of hope. Uh, so I'm going to show you some examples also of what I think it could become if we start going on this path. So what does good look like, right? So one example is I see many, many management teams actually adopting some forms of agile ways of working. And I think that is really important. That is really powerful uh, because in any culture change, leaders go first. Right? I mean, you can, you, can, you can expect everyone else to do something else, but if you don't change, if you don't show that you also actually uh, walk the talk, then, I mean, you won't end up anywhere. So this is an example of uh, some of our work with, uh, with Kay Smiling, the CIO of Aegon. Um, and, uh, you know, he started on this transformation path and he started, you know, people started to self-organize and we started to have agile teams. Um, and then he started realizing that his management team is also a team and uh, should probably also present what they've been doing and ask for feedback. So that's what he did. So he started talking to people and said, you know, do you think our management team are do focusing on the right things? And people said, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I have no idea what you're doing every Monday morning from 9 to 12, right? You're, you're having all these meetings, but there's no insight into what you're actually doing and focusing on. So this was a big aha moment for them. And they changed that. So he started to, to do almost like sprint reviews with, with their colleagues. Like, hey, this is what the management team has been focusing on. Uh, do you feel that's relevant? Is there any other things that you need? Um, so he started adopting that mindset. And I think that is helpful when we see leaders do that. And I see, see that happening more and more. Um, another example from a digital first company. Um, you might be sick of all the Spotify and Facebook examples, but here's the Airbnb example. Um, a while ago, I was visiting them in California at their headquarters. And I had the opportunity to talk to, to Mike Curtis, the VP of engineering. Um, and, I, and, and I just came back from Spotify. So I'd, I've, I've done some research being, being there and worked there. So I was like super enthusiastic about how de their culture functioned. So I came to that company assuming like, oh, you, must be have, you must be doing probably similar things, right? So like the squats and stripes and we have our, uh, you know, we have all these sprints and, and the product owners. And I asked him like, what do you, what do you think about that? And I, he said, he was super surprised. He said, I hate all that stuff. Like I really totally, <laughs> utterly hate it. I hate agile. What? Well, I was super confused. And then he started explaining what they did instead. And what I really uh, uh, enjoyed, he said, well, this sounds a lot like micromanagement to me, right? All of those structures and processes are geared towards getting more predictability. And we don't need all the predictability, we need impact, right? Impact is more important than predictable outcomes, knowing what is going to be delivered by when at what cost. If you let go of that, and you just have highly empowered teams, highly, highly capable teams, and you give them uh, goals in a domain, they can just run without all of that stuff. That is what, to me, goes to the heart and the essence of what Agile was all about before all the frameworks and practices started emerging. Um, so it's one example. Another one is close to here is uh, Skippo Airport. Does anybody here works or worked at Skippo Airport? Just a curiosity. <laughs> ah, Saskia, hey, good to see you. Um, 
So, um, as many, uh, there, there were many people involved in their uh, digital uh, transformation, and, and I was one of them. Um, and there was this corner of the organization that was responsible for all the digital channels. Uh, so, there was the, the, the department that did the website, the mobile app, all the kiosks and screens on the airport. So, everything that the customer directly interacts with, they, they did. It's a group of 70 engineers, designers, product people, business people that were working together every day to improve the, the customer experience. And this department was led by only one manager, one formal manager, Rosanna van der Stam, and um, you know, she was responsible for this whole operation. And she built this culture of highly entrepreneurial, high-performing, and highly self-organizing teams. Um, and one moment in time, the HR department knocked on the doors and said, you know what, it's time for the annual performance review. Could you please fill out 70 of these forms for all the individuals that work here to rate their performance? And she was like, hell no. Like, not at all, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not even capable of doing that because you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in what they do. Um, so she, she, she brought that problem to the teams and they figured out how to do a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, performance review. Um, and that kind of continued and they became, they became comfortable in hiring their own people. Teams hired their own people from the market. They were comfortable in changing the team composition, firing people uh, even from the team. Um, and they did, the teams did it all uh, by themselves. Um, and HR was really confused. <laughs> um, another thing is like the only actual function that Rosanna was, was to work on the system to make sure this way of working could exist inside this more corporate bubble because it was very uncommon that there was only one manager with 70 direct reports, right? That, that was not done in, inside the organization. So he was protecting the bubble. And I see more, of the, more and more of that happening. I see more and more leaders adopting this idea. Um, and that's cool. And one of them is Rick Molinar. He had this uh, really nice uh, LinkedIn post, which is, for the last two weeks, we have given total control to our engineers to make their own decisions on how to organize themselves as well as what to work on. And the only request was that they would try to improve one of our key business performance indicators, and the results were amazing. So it, it can be done. Like, even if you just try it for two weeks, why not? Like, you know, what is the, what is the downside of that? What is the risk of that? Why can't we just completely let go of everything and, uh, and let engineers figure it out? Because, you know, these are highly capable people. Uh, we had to fight on the talent market to get them. Why not just you know, tell, let, let them tell us what to do? Which is not to what we see in our Agile frameworks often. And I think there's more hope because we see some of those ideas codified as well. So there's one of the, one of the frameworks that I'm following a lot, which is Fast Agile by uh, Ron Cortel. Um, and Fast Agile stands for Fluid Agile Scaling Technology. And uh, I really love the, the title of one of the case studies, which is Self-Organization Eats Agile at Scale for Breakfast. So yeah, it's, it's really worth looking into. Also, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, don't, I'm not saying this is the silver bullet because there are no silver bullets. It, it's based on four very simple ideas. Um, first of all, bring everyone together to work on, as one collective. Visually represent business goals on a wall. Let the collective self-organize into teams to break down and do the work. And on a short cadence, synchronize and repeat the above step. So it's, it's very much based on open space and open allocation of people combined with, with agile practices. Um, and it's, it's really worth looking at it. So I'm, I'm kind of hopeful because they're starting to see some of those patterns being presented and being successfully implemented. And <laughs> who of you has read Reinventing Organizations? Do you remember the book? Yeah, like, uh, oof, I was expecting more people. Um, highly recommend taking a look. It's a beautiful book about what it means to, to work in a different way without uh, the traditional management hierarchies. Um, but what people don't realize, that book was written almost a decade ago. Uh, and do we see more teal organizations at the moment? I don't know. Like there's, there's examples out there, but um, have you seen it being practiced in where you are working now in, in your agile teams? Um, I think what I do see is I see more examples coming out where people are not from the Agile world trying these things and having great success. And I want to show, give you some, some examples of evolutionary organizations. I'll, I'm going to show you just two. Um, so the first one is Schubert Phyllis. Does anybody here work at Schubert Phyllis or work there? OK, good. Because um, they might, might call me out for, for having bullshit. But I've worked with them. <laughs> I have worked yeah. with them as well. Um, they are a group of 400 people. And they are proving that when it comes to self-management and self-organization, it can even be done in mission-critical uh, places. Because so often we hear this excuse like, yeah, I mean, it's great. Like, you know, if you're making an app, sure, they can self-organize because the risk is low. But these people, they, they run logistics uh, supply chains. They run trading floors of banks. Um, they, they run energy companies and container terminals. 
So you know, they're proving that if you, that these you know these self-managing principles can be applied without the downside of of you know chaos and risk. Um, one of the things they were uh, facing is um, that without management, there was still this desire for people to grow and to have some performance feedback and to know how their career paths would go, how they could increase their salaries. Um, that is still work that needs to be done. Right in the past, you were forced to talk about that with your line manager who you didn't pick. Um, and that may or may not go well, right? You have all this you know, theater, and like, can we, you know, do, you, do you like me? Like his pony tricks, uh, uh, and can you maybe give me a raise? Like this is what's happening. Um, but they, they wanted to do it differently, which is more uh, people positive. And this, this is how they did it. So they created this marketplace of coaches within the organization. Um, about 15 people, or maybe even more these days, are holding an additional role uh, of coach. They get trained, they get selected, they have to qualify for that. But it's just colleagues among each other that are also doing this coach role. And then they raise their hand like, hey, I'm available as coach. And everyone else in the organization is expected to have a coach, to select a coach themselves. So this is, first of all, a two-way marketplace. So you pick the coach that you feel is best suitable to talk to for you. Um, and that's where the performance conversation happens. Uh, that's where we talk about career development. And that's where we talk about salary increase and what's reasonable. So you see that the work of management is now distributed among the people. Uh, because management, you know, there's definitely value-added activities in what management does, but not everything, right? So this is one, one thing to consider when you start doing self-organization. You need to solve some of the same problems, but then in a different way. One other example, and there's more and more content coming out on, on hire at the moment, is, is hire. It's a Chinese um, uh, appliance manufacturer with 80,000 people. And Hire is an inter interesting example because they have uh, they've been around for many decades and they have had many evolutions of their organizational model, right? So they worked in a traditional management hierarchy for a long time. Then they went to a functional organization. Then they started to doing cross-functional teams. And in their last reorganization, they fired all of the middle management, just fired them all um, at once, which is, I don't know if I would recommend it, but it's definitely interesting. <laughs> Um, and, but then what, right? So they broke up their company into 4,000 self-managing teams. 4,000 self-managing teams. They call them micro-enterprises. These micro-enterprises are 10 to 30 people, and they're responsible. They're P&L responsible for what they do. They're responsible for, uh, for delivering value in, in their domain. Um, and they deliver value internally and externally. So imagine you work somewhere and you, you, you have you know, some, some questions about HR. You go to your HR department. But in higher, there are multiple HR departments competing to each other. Uh, and every department is actually trying to be customer focused and improve. One of the most interesting things I think there is leaders are elected. So if, if, if my micro enterprise doesn't work because maybe my leader is showing bad behavior or is not capable of doing it, the team can just fire the leader and force a re-election. Same goes for if the numbers don't add up and if the numbers are not correct, the system will force a re-election of the leader. Um, so imagine, imagine what would happen in your company if your leaders had to apply for their own jobs every, every year, right? So I'm curious what would happen. Um, a really interesting example, and I see other large enterprises uh, experimenting with similar ideas, and this might be the next big thing in terms of become a networked, uh, agile, self-managing organization. All right, so this is all great. You don't work at Hire, you don't work at Schubert Village, you don't work at Schiphol, you work somewhere else. What can you do? So if you feel yourself stuck in agile bureaucracy and facing some of the the common anti-patterns that we showed in the beginning, what, is some, what are some of the practical things you can start doing? Let me, let, let me take a look. First of all, don't blame the fish. Right? What do, I mean with, what do I mean with that? You all look very puzzled. So let me explain. Don't blame the fish. So, so often when I work with companies, uh, I go talk to the teams. And the teams are like, oh, the, our leaders, you know. Our leaders and they don't get what I do they continuously uh, come to us with new problems to solve but they, they, they just don't get what I'm doing and they never listen to all the things I asked them to do for us right so if we if we would just have different leaders I mean our life would be improved then you go talk to the leaders yeah you know, guess what they're saying um, oh man our people you know we're not getting the results they're not going fast enough and I, I try to explain every time what we're trying to do and they, they, they seem to be wasting their time we probably just need new people, right? We need new talent. We need new. We hire. Need need to hire new people because some of them they will never get it, right? So, I mean, this is to a certain extent probably true, but there to a much larger extent, it's it's blaming the fish. It's blaming the people that are showing up every day to do their best work uh, with the best intentions and tell them that they're doing it wrong. 
in our mind, and in our work at the Ready, we really believe we should focus on the aquarium instead, right? Focus on the environment, focus on the system, and change the behaviors in the system so that people show up and the right behavior emerges, right? So um, if you take a fish out of the aquarium and you train them, you give them a product owner certification, and they go back into the same fishbowl, well, guess what happens? They'll, they'll be forced to show the same behavior because that's how the system works. So start fixing the system. But then the question is, how do you observe the system? How do you, how do you actually talk about what the system is about? And we've developed the, the operating system canvas. We talk about an operating system when it comes to organizational ways of being. And um, this is 12 different fields. And you could say 12 different lenses of how you can look at the organization. Um, and this is uh, a conversation tool. It's neutral. Um, you can put it up on the wall and start having the conversation about the operating system. What about this is actually working well for us? What are the things that are going well? What are the things that are, are, are bright spots and we shouldn't really change? And what are the things that are really painful at the moment? So maybe it's about authority and decision making. That's where the, where the problem is. Maybe it's because our meetings are ineffective. Maybe we cannot prioritize. Um, and then obviously, one box is all often connected to other boxes. And that's how systems thinking work, right? If you see multiple angles of the same thing, you get a better understanding and you can actually do something about it. So you could use it in your agile retrospectives, but, but uh, to even better, to have a conversation with the leaders that might be able to change this thing. What are the principles and practices of each field, and what are the things we could try and, and change? Um, another thing that we often have is I want to get rid of all those debates about this is a practice that we want to do, and this is, this is safe is bad, and unless is good, and like, I want to get rid of that. And how do you get rid of that problem? Well, first of all, very often we have not defined the principles of our new organization. We have not defined the underlying principles and beliefs that we want to create and we want to adopt when adopting an Agile framework. So we haven't talked about the soil that actually creates the, the things that we're building on. And if you have defined your principles, like here's some examples and there's more in the article over there, like trust over verification, participation over power, progress over perfection. I mean, these could be Agile principles, but I would highly recommend to use the Agile manifesto as inspiration and then build your own because your context might be different. Other trade-offs might be more <laughs> important uh, for the culture you're working in. Um, if you have those principles and somebody comes up with, let's implement SAFE, you can say, okay, let's take a look at SAFE and what elements of skilled Azure framework are aligned with our principles and which are not. Well, maybe just do the ones that are aligned with our principles and you can stop the debate. Or maybe you can say, we should try both because both are aligned with our principles and you know, who knows which, what will work for us. Let's try, let's try both. So principles are important and we often forget it. Um, another thing, um, this is not about fish, this is about cars. Visualize the waste. So maybe you've tried talking to your leaders. Maybe you've tried everything out of the book and you're still not succeeding. Well, maybe you should just then change the conversation and make things more transparent. So um, a while ago, I was working with a group of agile teams in, uh, in a financial institution. And they were, every sprint, they were you know, energized to deliver. But every sprint, they had to wait for another department. They had to wait for a go. They didn't have access to the systems that would apply them to deploy software. So they basically were wasting a lot of time just to get stuff out of the door. And one of the, one of the scrum masters was brilliant. And he said, well, you know what? Maybe we should start taking count and just counting the beans. And he started counting all the hours that people were wasting. And, you know, read, you know, roughly, how many hours did we waste this time on, on waiting, on, on not being able to deliver? And what's our hourly rate? Well, let's talk about that. So he added that number. And every sprint review, we had stakeholders at the sprint review. He started showing, like, you know what? This was maybe 10,000 euros. You know what, what we could have bought from 10,000 euros? A very nice old timer. And you know what we've actually done with that? We smashed it into a wall, yeah. right? So every time, you know, and this started adding up. Like uh, after a quarter, they wasted a, a beautiful brand new Ferrari, which they just smashed into a wall. Like, and this started to compound and compound. This became this kind of a joke. However, management took notice. They were like, ooh, that sounds painful. That sounds like something we don't want. And that's how they engaged with the conversation. So if you cannot, change stuff, one thing that is in your influence is how you present the waste and how you actually try to get attention. This was one of the fun ways, and there are many other ways. Um, so Alan Hullop uh, is a, also a good uh, person to follow on Twitter, and he recently said this, which I really uh, like. You don't force an agile transformation onto people. Instead, stop doing the things that prevent agility, and the transformation takes care of itself. So I really believe this, and um, maybe it's naive, and leaders will say it won't work for us, However, we've had great results with this. And what does it look like in practice? So first of all, the, the big powerful question is, what is stopping you from doing the best work of your life? 
Um, it's a powerful question. I want this question to be asked and answered more and more and more. And especially if you have to work with leaders that are, that are not ready to change or not ready to adopt uh, agile, agile practices. Um, often the conversation is like, you should do a stand-up. Well, sure, we, we do a stand-up. Like, or you should do a retrospective. Yeah, well, I don't know why, but let's try it. Instead, if you ask this question and maybe stand beside those leaders and say, hey, what is actually in your way? What, what do you lie uh, awake at night about? What is, what is the thing that you're really worried about? And then let's, start, let's find solutions for that that are aligned with more agile principles and practices. So start where the energy is. Start where, where, the, where it hurts and start where uh, the things are that people care about. Um, what does it look like in practice? This is a change loop. There are many uh, other ways of doing it, but the, our change framework is actually a loop and it's super simple. Right? Start where the tension is, then consider possible practices to do and run an experiment. So when you run an experiment, you have to find an experiment that is safe to try. That's not a big, big problem, right? We often need to then have present and it has to be perfect and we have to all align. No, just find something that is safe to try. Some, something that we can try within four months or some, uh, something we can try in a quarter of the organization, something that is small enough so it gives us some learning and it's big enough that we can actually try some impact. So start, pe start helping people on this loop um, and you know, even better, connect it to business outcomes because that's what people care about, right? Uh, if, you, if you're looking for practices, um, there's many lists out there. Brave New Work, one, one of our books, has a great list and we have a deck of cards with possible options. And, there's 80 practices uh, in this deck of cards. I would say about a third of them are resemble agile practices and the other two thirds are other stuff. Um, things about outside of the agile world, in the teal world, in other progressive organization world, that are possible things that if you could put the experiment around it, it actually works. And then we, you know, maybe some of you will think like experimentation, that's all great, but you know what, um, that sounds chaotic. Right? That sounds like we're going to lose control because people are starting to experiment. Like the, the people have this idea in their heads about what experimentation is. Um, but I believe strongly in structured experimentation. Just like the scientific method, we define an hypothesis. Uh, we, we try to prove or disprove. We add our data points. We add our possible assumptions that we're having in our system. And we make it very tangible. Because if you do experimentation in this way, you can also get on a one-page uh, approval if you need approval. Uh, of doing, trying something, and you have a good way of measuring, uh, did it actually work for us or not, right? If, if it's just like, yeah, I'm gonna try a stand-up, and I think it will, like if it's very loose, then there's also no real tangible way of saying it actually worked and we should scale that up. And yeah, there's a, there's a template on our website, an article you can see. Um, and then people will say, well, yeah, how do you scale experimentation? How do you do that? Well, um, some of you probably already know, we're, we're talking about building a movement, right? We're talking about building the energy for people to go uh, focusing on pull instead of push, which is very different. So you start in an area of the organization that is ripe, or a team, or a set of teams that are like, yeah, I love this, this let, let's try it, and it's safe to experiment here, like the digital channels at Skipple. Yes, we can do it here, we believe it works for us, and then you have this bubble. And then other people take notice. So at Skipple, marketing department came in and like, ooh, that's interesting. Shall we try some of that here? Um, and they started doing it there, and you see more and more people. And then uh, over time, um, the movement cannot be ignored. It's too big to reverse. People just don't want to go back. They say, sure, I, no, I'm not going to do your stupid performance review process. Like, f, f you, like it's, it's I'm not going to do it at all, hell no. Um, and that's how you scale. Um, going through where the energy is, going through experimentation, asking people what is stopping you, and let's try to get rid of that, adopting agile practices along the way. All right, so I want to summarize everything I just said. What is an agile organization? What is the organization we want? Well, a true agile organization, in my mind, needs to achieve two things. It needs to enable people to do the best work of their lives, and it needs to be capable of adapting to the business challenge. It has to be continuously morphing. It's never done. It has to change if it doesn't work. It has to be serving the purpose or the outcome that you want. Right? That's what we want to get with, with agile organizations. And we don't get it by doing it in a plan-driven way. Right? We don't get it by you know, a committee designing a reorganization, one-size-fits-all solution, top-down implementation, controlled communication, and a ser series of initiatives. No, we really believe that a transformation is a continuous discovery. Right? You, want, you want this organization to be continuously evolving, and you do that with the people in a participatory way in a series of experiments with a lot of learning going on along the way. Um, so if you're stuck in agile bureaucracy, three things you can do. First of all, make sure your work is fueled by the outcome that people care about. Right, so um, start where it currently hurts and where, we, where, where the work of working is in the way of getting the outcomes you want. 
invite everyone to participate and adopt a new way of working instead of you know, telling people what to do. And finally, propose this safe to try experiment that is connected to the business outcomes that you want to try. I want to leave you with this story, the high jump. Is there any athletics people in the room? People tried it, yeah? Have you ever tried this wave, high jumping? No. I would never try it. Like it, <laughs> it sounds very risky to me. Um, but this is how people did it for decades. Maybe, I don't know, maybe over centuries. Like this was the high jump, the only way to do a high jump. Until in the 60s, Dick Fosbury came, up, came along. And his trainer said, you shouldn't do that. Like it doesn't work. Like it's, no, no, no. This, you know, he tried to talk them out of it. And then in 1968, he went and won the gold medal and broke the world record. Um, and nobody ever achieved the world record in a different way than this. Like this is the new standard. Like this is how you do the high jump and get better results, right? Going backwards and uh, landing on your, on your back. Um, and I think whenever I show this presentation, uh, I get similar reactions. Like, yeah, it works, it works for me. It works for that company, but it won't work for him. And it's the same with Dick Fosbury. Everybody, when they started seeing doing that, first of all, responded, yeah, it works for Dick, but it doesn't work for us, right? He's a freak. There's something special about his autonomy. Like, yeah, I would never be able to do that. Like, what Dick is doing is just crazy. And given that that's a new standard, like, I think there's a similarity in our system. Like, the only way to actually find out is to start jumping. And that's my encouragement. Start trying, start jumping, start changing, and get your way out of agile bureaucracy. Thank you very much.